Hi everyone, welcome. So this week I'm participating in a webinar which is organized by the FDA and it's geared towards uh, the patient and advocacy communities for rare diseases. Um, talking about uh, how drug development works and uh, what um, patients and advocacy groups can do to enable drug development. So this webinar is about the specific topic of natural history studies. Uh, I was in a natural history study on dysferlinopathy, uh, LGMD2B, from 2014 through 2018. And I also work for the Jane Foundation, which uh, sponsored the natural history study. Um, so the FDA um, asked me to be on a panel and they wanted me to talk about both my personal experiences as a study participant as well as the bigger picture of what the study accomplished to uh, enable drug development and clinical trial readiness. So this is going to be one part of the webinar. The entire webinar is about uh, four hours, and then there's going to be with myself and I believe um, three other presenters at my session a question and answer about uh, natural history studies. Hi everyone, I'm Brad Williams. I have a type of muscular dystrophy called dysferlinopathy, also known as limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2B or R2. I work as director of research for an advocacy organization, the Jane Foundation, that's dedicated to finding treatments and cures for this disease. In the picture, you see me with my coworkers. I'm the one that's seated. A little bit about this type of muscular dystrophy. It doesn't typically have onset in childhood, but rather in adolescence or early adulthood. I started to have symptoms when I was 18. Also, unlike some other types of MD, it's equally likely to affect women and men. It's considered an ultra-rare disease, and there are thought to be a few thousand patients in the U.S. It wasn't until the genetic mutation causing the disease was discovered in 1998 that dysferlinopathy could be researched as a specific type of muscular dystrophy. It's categorized as a form of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which is a group of about 30 different diseases, each caused by mutations in a different gene. About 10 years ago, the Jane Foundation started planning a natural history study for dysferlinopathy because not much was known about the disease. One of the major questions the study tried to answer was which tests or outcome measures as they're referred to could best track the progress of the disease and test how effective a treatment is in a future clinical trial. For this reason, the study was called the Clinical Outcome Study in Dysferlinopathy. I was a participant in the study. Before I share my personal experiences, here are some overall facts about the study. It was quite a large study for such a rare disease and involved a number of clinical centers in several countries. It also lasted for several years because dysferlinopathy has a fairly slow progression as muscular dystrophies go. So the study had to last long enough to be able to see a significant change in the participants. I had seven study visits between 2014 and 2018. During the first four visits, I lived in the Washington DC area where one of the study sites was located. So it was just a short trip across town, but then I moved to Seattle. So for the last three visits, I had a very long trip. This brings up an important point about travel. It can not only be expensive and difficult on the participants, but in a study like this one, where you're testing a person's strength, being tired from travel can affect the data you collect. Also, depending on the disease and what degree of disability it causes in the study participants, it may be necessary to make some allowances. 
for example, allowing a recovery day between travel and evaluation in the study and allowing a person to accompany the participant. Fortunately, in the COVID era, the concept of using remote assessments to supplement in-person visits is gaining acceptance. So I'd encourage anyone designing a natural history study today to think about how they might use remote assessments in their study. Each of my visits lasted most of a day, and there were a whole lot of tests done, uh, including muscle strength, heart and lung function, uh, MRIs, blood samples collected, uh, surveys on how MD was uh, impacting my life, and more. Uh, I wasn't ambulatory during the study. Uh, the people who were went through even more tasks, such as evaluating their walking ability. The idea was to test as many things as possible to see which gave useful information about the disease's progression. Uh, I didn't find the study visits unpleasant in any way, uh, although I was fairly tired by the end of the day. Mostly, my reaction was that I was happy to know that after having lived with the disease for so many years, finally there was a serious effort to really learn about it. And as you can see by how many papers were published based on the data collected in the study, uh, indeed a lot was learned. The study gave some really good information needed to design clinical trials. It showed what the best outcome measure was to use. Uh, it was actually an outcome measure that was adapted from uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And even though it was tested in our study for LGMD2B, it's now being used in clinical trials for other LGMD subtypes. Also, the study showed which patients would be the most likely to so show significant change in a year's time and how many participants you'd need in a clinical trial to show statistical significance in a treatment that was able to stop progression but didn't increase a person's strength. Now, this slide lists the successes of the study, but the study also found a number of uh, tests that wouldn't make good outcome measures in a trial. Uh, that's important because a lot of times knowing what not to do is just as important as knowing what to do. Uh, a couple other benefits from the cost study. It created a group of clinicians at the study sites who uh, all became familiar with the disease, with conducting these tests, and with working together. Really, a natural history study is just a dress rehearsal for a clinical trial. So having a bunch of people who've already conducted a natural history study together can help a clinical trial to go much more smoothly. Also, the data collected from COS uh, enabled us to develop a standard of care for this disease, which never existed before. So even before there were approved treatments, having done a natural history study can help patients receive better care. So some of the lessons that were learned from doing this study, uh, the most important one is on the slide. Uh, when COS was first being planned 10 years ago, we were nowhere near having a treatment to test for dysphrenopathy. But now we do have treatments in or close to clinical trials, and it's really good that we started the natural history study when we did, because uh, they can take a, quite a while. Uh, in a lot of diseases, there are treatments ready to test, but a lack of natural history information needed to design a clinical trial. This delays the clinical trial process and so I would encourage everyone uh, to start a natural history study as soon as possible, even before you think you are going to have a treatment to test. Also, having natural history data and information about which outcome measures to use in clinical trials makes a disease much more attractive to drug developers. 
So just the act of doing a natural history study increases the chances that there will be treatments to test sooner. I also want to mention that COS isn't the only natural history study that I've participated in. I took part in a couple of other studies which didn't produce any publications, so nobody really knows what was found. Uh, this is both a loss to the scientific and medical communities, as well as making the participants feel that their efforts uh, didn't contribute anything. And on a related point, it's important for study organizers to give feedback to participants so that they know what impact their participation is having. Uh, this helps them to feel not like they're guinea pigs, but rather what they really are, which is active participants in the development of treatments for their diseases.